Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 2nd, 2014, and this is the week in charts. The voice on the Ariana is amazing. <laughs> is that a joke, Frenchie? Um, anyway, um, there is uh, a lot to cover this week, and this week I really beat it. Once again, last minute, I was just jamming slides in and taking slides that I took out and putting it back in, and You'll see in a minute. We have a lot to cover. So I'm going to get a little jacked up on oh, some Mountain Dew. Make us Mountain Dew, which is PepsiCo. Do not endorse this show. But uh, if you're out there, give me a shout out. Um, Red Bull said I was too fat. Well, <laughs> they're probably right. All right. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. You read the book. You like the book. Otherwise, I don't know why you'd be here. <laughs> Sometimes we have more people here than we have book reviews. So um, put me a review on Amazon. And uh, this link will bring you there. Even if you just say I agree with everyone else because... Um, as I say almost every week, to a point of ad nauseum, some people are malignant and they just review their reviews. They don't even bother to read the book. Well, I don't have time to complain about that today because we've got too much to cover. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, it, I started culling out my slides from last week, and then I found myself actually putting stuff back in. So we're going to um, talk about a lot of the things we covered again last week, but I'm going to Go a little bit quicker this week because he spent, oh, I don't know, an hour or so on that last week. Um, very timely thing now. I mean, the, these shows, as you know, are very timely based on what's going on. It's the week in charts, right? That's the, the, the general idea in addition to a lecture or two or something that's uh, worthwhile. But I try to use as many current examples as possible. And right now, we've got a situation where we could be in uh, – some we could have some transitional patterns so I want to talk about how important and how awesome trans transitional patterns are um, I want to talk about doing the right thing and doing dumb things and that's gonna make a lot more sense in about two minutes um, let's talk about gambling versus trading and and you'll see why I'm talking about this in just one second but the, if you're trading you have a methodology and you have a methodology that hopefully you study for a long, long time. Um, I've read a lot of books in the past about success and becoming a success and talent and, and all these different things. And, and talent is made and not born. I believe that. Um, I don't have any innate talents, but there's nothing in the world, well, you know, short of uh, – short of being a professional athlete, I guess, that I, that I can't do. And, and I'm not saying that to be vain. It's just, I just do it. If, if, um, if I want to learn about something, I do it. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to sail. I bought a book on sailing. And within a few years, I was sailing around the world. Well, not completely around the world, but to a few countries. Um, so, but that, those skills didn't happen overnight. It took a while to get good at it, and I made a lot of mistakes, and, and I almost uh, uh, sank a few times. And, and you know, this bad things happen in the learning process. But you have a methodology, and you, it's something that you studied at, and you worked at, and you get good at through hours and hours of study by putting your time in. You have a plan. You know how everything works. You know the nuances of your methodology. So you know that there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times, there's going to be some in-between times, so you know that you need a plan. Your risks are going to be defined. You know that bad things can happen, so you don't take excessive risks. You follow your plan slash methodology knowing that the odds are with you, not on every single trade, but longer term, Okay. The odds of any given trade um, can be quite random, but if you're trading with the trend and you've got a good setup, and let's say you've got 
it could be a variety of setups, obviously. But let's say you've got a deep pullback. That market is due to revert back to the mean in the direction of the trend. In other words, a pullback. And it's oversold. And you get a trigger. You know there's a good chance it might just snap right back. And you might get a initial profit out of it. And then you know you trail that stop. And it might turn into a longer term trend. Longer term especially if the market and the sector are behind you and you really like the setup. And by liking the setup, you know what characteristics make a good setup. You've, you've looked at enough of them to know. And it's like, um, I guess like a, uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, you've got some secret program. I think I read somewhere that um, they try to train computers to, to recognize a cancer on the cell or some kind of abnormal growth or whatever. But if you've got uh, a doctor or a scientist that's been studying for years and years and years, and, and, and as soon as he glances in the, micro, in the uh, microscope, he can see it. So you'll know it when you see it as you become better and better to have experience. I mean, I think the thing I didn't mean to get into, but the thing I got into is it, it comes with experience. You're not going to become that doctor, that lawyer, that automatic transmission mechanic or a sailboat racer overnight you're going to have it's going to take a little time and it's going to take a little learning and more importantly it's going to take a little experience so you do all these things and then you reach a point where you get pretty good at it you still make mistakes you still do dumb things and you still learn every day that's a given okay the day we stop learning is the day we're dead but there's some sort of structure to it all if you take a pattern you've seen that pattern a thousand times you may have traded it a hundred times, okay? So you know what you're doing. You know what the pattern is. Gambling is more off the cuff. Oh, I'm going to take a flyer. I see these options are cheap, okay? Even though the stock's headed the wrong way, even though in order for them to get into money, you would have to, a, a miracle would have to occur. The stock would have to stop going down. The stock would have to turn around and go straight back up. And all of this is going to have to happen within a certain amount of time. Okay? So there's a lot of ifs that are going to have to happen. You, you don't have a plan. So in general, instead of waiting for that entry on a stock, let's say you do have a methodology, but instead of waiting for that entry on that setup, you decide, well, I'm going to get in early. Well, the market's choppy or not cooperating, but I don't care about that. I would just go ahead and get in early. Now, there are some times, not to get too far sidetracked, maybe if you're in a 1999 situation with the market's going straight up, then you might want to get in a little early, okay? But anything less than that, you definitely want to wait for an entry. You also want to be very selective, okay? You want to pick the best of the best stocks based on your methodology. If you're gambling, it's just off the cuff, willy-dilly. Uh, this thing's going down, so I think it's going to stop going down. It's going to turn around and start going up. And because these options are cheap, so to speak, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to buy a bunch of these options, okay? Um, and in general, if you're gambling, you don't have a plan, obviously, okay? And then the other thing is you risk it all. If you're buying out of the money lottery ticket type of options, and there are times when you could actually do that, okay? Don't get me wrong, okay? If a market is, uh, is let's say you just took a huge windfall profit on something, and you, you could fritter away a small, very small portion of those proceeds on some wild, pardon my French ass, as my little French friend used to say, Dave, that sounds like English. Uh, anyway, uh, wild ass options, you know, then, then knock yourself out, okay? Because there are certain situations, I don't want to get into it too deeply, but let's say you had a stock that just went absolutely parabolic on you. Well, you know you're going to have, to, you're going to have some sort of correction go against you, and it's going to be painful. So if you're selling out at those parabolic levels, then the amount of money that it would have corrected against you, you could fritter away a small portion of that, whatever you figure that's going to be, and, and just kind of, and I hate to use it, you know, I hate to be a potty mouth, but piss it away, for, fritter it away, that's a better word, fritter it away on some options. But that's one thing, okay? 
You're coming from a position of strength. You've got that's some sort of uh, advanced technique. I don't get into that too much. Sometimes if I'm mentoring someone, we'll talk about those situations, and that's an incredible good problem to have and, and there's some psychological reasons for doing that it's kind of keeps you that win-win situation and if you lose you just lose it so such a little bit you've already made so much you're you're so far ahead of the game what I'm talking about gambling I'm talking about not having that kind of plan in place and buying a stock because you think it's going down enough and it should start going up now, if all you do is bottom fish in stocks and you've got some kind of methodology in place and you studied it for 10, 15, 20 years, then by all means, knock yourself out if that's what you do, okay? If you have studied options until you're blue in the face and you you know that certain out-of-the-money options are mispriced based on X, Y, and Z, and that's all you do, and you spent a significant portion of of your life doing that, then by all means, knock yourself out. By the way, as I think it was Gladwell wrote, in fact, I know it was Gladwell, in Outliers, you need to read the book if you haven't already read it. It's a very good book. But he wrote that it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in your field, okay? Now, I could shorten that learning curve significantly, but again, you're still going to have to put in your time. So if you put 10,000 hours into trading options, okay, then trade options. If that's what you do, then that's what you do, okay? But gambling is not having a plan, doing things uh, off the cuff. You risk it all. You say, okay, well, I'm going to, those options are cheap. I'm going to just drop 1,000 on them. And then you just immediately burn through $1,000. You might as well just throw it out the window. Speaking of dumb things, this was someone just emailed me yesterday. It said they bought some out-of-the-money options on this stock. Now, which way is this stock headed? It's headed lower, okay? It's a gold stock. Which way is gold headed? It's headed lower, okay? Just because something is going down, doesn't mean it's going to turn around. Write that down. Getting a lesson from Dr. Seuss today. Just because something is going, going down doesn't mean it's going to turn around. Now, not only does it have to turn around, it's got to turn around between now and option expiration out here. So now we got time. Okay, you're up against time. And then it's got to go, it's got to not only stop going down and turn around, now it's got to go up a certain amount, okay, and get past this level here by a significant amount, by the cost of those options at expiration in order to make money. So it's a dumb thing to just go out and do things on a flyer. That's gambling, okay. Now, speaking of dumb things, and, and this is what amazes me that uh, that people will waste all this money in the markets gambling, but they won't spend a little bit of money to get educated, okay? They'll spend $10,000 on Alibaba, the most stupidest, hyped, stupid IPO in stupid town, okay? Just on a flyer, they'll plop down ten grand, but they won't spend four hundred dollars to watch a course to have access less than four dollars to have access to a course on IPOs, which will tell you flat out not to buy an IPO like Alibaba unless it does certain things. And so far, it hasn't done certain things. Now, I won't give too much away by saying this. In the course, we talked a lot about what I call a die and a die. And one of the things I said, keep it along that, keep it along with that Dr. Seuss theme. If it's priced too high, usually they're going to die. Okay, in this particular case, the offer price was like sixty or something. It came public at I don't know around a hundred. I guess it was ninety to hundred. It ran up to. Um, and by the way, don't think, oh, I wish I could have got some of those shares. Well, yeah, we all wish we could have got some of those shares, right, If you know, in perfect hindsight. 
But keep in mind that in order to get those shares, you got to be willing to take a lot of crap and not flip it out. Okay, so for the one Alibaba where you make 50% overnight, of course, you can't flip it out yet, so we're not sure how much you're going to make in the long run. You have to eat a lot of dogs, or take a lot of dogs, I should say. So um, the bottom line is there's no free lunch, so don't think that you could have got it at 60. If you did get it at 60, then you probably have gotten a lot of other crappy IPOs over the years. Anyway, I digress. But you can see that so far, this has only gone down. Okay, So that's a dumb thing, buying Alibaba. More dumb stuff. And this happens all the time. I mean, this is the advantage I have is that I have an educational business and I'm constantly reminded of what not to do on the retail side. Okay, As a private trader, I'm constantly reminded what not to do. Of course, the market starts selling off. What happens? My phone starts ringing. Dave, what should I do? And this is after the fact, of course. And we look at the account and was like, well, well, okay, I recognize these stocks. They were on my Landry list, but the market really has been kind of bouncing around a lot lately. You were kind of aggressive at going after a lot of these stocks. Yeah, if we're in a rip-roaring bull market, then by all means, buy as many as you want. But when the market's not doing so great, you want to be real selective, and you don't want to be front-running, meaning getting in early on these positions, and a lot of them just didn't trigger. Well, this didn't trigger. Why are you at it? Well, I front-ran the position. I got it early. I didn't want to wait. Okay, so you're not following that plan, and you're not being super selective. You're being selective in that you've got, not that my blessing means anything, obviously, but you've got my blessing on the position because I listed it, but you don't want to rush out and get in early, especially when conditions are less than ideal, like they have been lately. Okay. And then once you get in it, it's okay to be a little aggressive getting into positions as long as you're just as aggressive when it comes to get out, meaning that you have you don't have to be aggressive. You just have to use a stop. So when you let positions get away from you, bad things happen really quick. Whenever I'm punching positions into a spreadsheet, if I leave off a zero, I'll see a whole portfolio implode. And I'm like, wow, look at that. You know, it's like a, I just I now I have a $30,000 loss at a 100K portfolio. That's 30% drawdown. That's significant. What happened? And then I realized, oh, I left off an O in this position when I was punching in the trade. And occasionally that happens. You'll fat figure something. But in doing that, it makes you realize, hey, wait a minute. I can get in a lot of trouble fast. If I did use a stop on this position, that could easily happen. Okay. Now, this way I had a hard time deleting these slides from last week, and some of them got deleted and put them back in. And let me just kind of rush through this because we talked about it at nauseam last week. And the, the, the thing is, I talked about employ, uh, stocks being like employees. You've got three employees that aren't doing anything, and you got one employee that is busting his butt, carrying the weight of everyone. Now, what are you going to do? Well, you should get rid of the employee that's performing because he's going to quit performing at any, at any time now. There's no way he's going to keep performing, okay? And those three bums you have, well, you should keep those because someday they're going to work. And maybe that someday is coming near. No, of course you wouldn't do that, right? And like a client emailed me a while back. He said he used to treat his his, his uh, stocks like little children. And it's true. It's like uh, a lot of people do that. You get attached to these stocks, and you want them to do good. And you're like, come on, little fella. You can do it. Okay? So you want to treat them as employees, and you want to fire any employee that's not performing, Okay, by violating company policy. Now, company policy says they must stay above the stop. That's the only rule. That's the only rule that you have for your employees. They must stay above the stop for longs or below the stop. 
for shorts. As long as they don't viol violate rule number one, they get to stay. As soon as they begin to violate those rules, you have to take them out. Okay? You have to be antiseptic. And this is, this is something that I really need to beat this term to death. A stock, especially now, it should be easy or easier. Okay? I have stock certificates on my wall. Some of you guys newer to trading are probably like, what the hell is that? <laughs> it's like last week we talked about cassette tapes. What, Dave, what is this thing you speak of? I'm beginning to show my age. Well, these stock certificates are representation of ownership in a company. Okay, I've got Studebaker and all kinds of cool things, some railroads and some companies I've never heard of, Eurofund, which I've never heard of, but I just thought it was kind of cool. Anyway, I've got all these Pan America, World Airways. I've got them all in my wall of my office. Most of them don't even exist anymore. And it represents ownership in a company. Well, that's sort of a tangible thing. And then nowadays, it's all just a blip of your screed. So for me, that's, that's like one step removed. That's just a little glow. That's a little LED or whatever the current technology is, LCD, whatever, a little glow on your screen. And you shouldn't be attached to that, okay? There's, no, there's nothing that physically represents it. You just... It, it, I don't know how to say it other than be antiseptic. Don't care what they do. Don't care about the earnings. It's just a bus. Get on the bus. And guess what? If you got to get off the bus, get off the bus. Another one will come along soon. you got 6,000 stocks out there. Uh, 2,000 to 2,500 are probably tradable. If you dig a little further and you're willing to take a little more risk, you probably go up to 3,000 or 4,000 that are tradable. Okay, so if it's not performing, it's not performing. You get stopped out, you get stopped out. Um, it, it, like I said last week, for me with an IPO, it's even easier because it's like you know that most of the IPOs are BS and one out of ten is going to work maybe, right, longer term. But shorter term, there's going to be some excitement involved, especially if the underwriters did it properly. Now, I'm going to stop short of saying Manipulation, as we would say here in Cajun land, but you kind of get my drift, right? Um, you have to admit failure, and you have to admit failure long before it actually exists. As I said a while back, and then I was talking with someone yesterday, they said, well, Dave, that sounds like you're quoting Douglas. Well, so maybe I am quoting Douglas, but like I've, I've told the story a thousand times, but I, I've, I went for a walk about six months ago, and as I left for the walk, I'm like, why? Why is it that people will not plan their trades? And that's what I was kind of thinking about. It, it didn't take me long in the walk to realize the reason people don't plan their trades is because the moment you plan a trade, you have to have a stop in mind. The moment you have a stop in mind is the moment you admit that you could be a failure. And nobody wants to admit they're a failure. But, and it's really cliche, but he who plans to, f he who fails to plan, plans to fail. Um, for me, I play a lot of games with my trading. And trust me, just because I have a pulse and put my name out there, hey, Big Dave's going to tell you all about trading, doesn't mean that I don't still have, just because I, I'm sorry, just because I decided to trade doesn't mean that I no longer have a pulse, any emotions. In fact, you need emotions to get through life. You have to, each each decision you make has to have a consequence. That's been proven by scientists. And um, I forget her name. I need to, uh, I need to write it down. My apologies. Uh, I need to look it up next week. But there was, um, I saw a psychologist speak a while back, and she said that without emotions, you can't make decisions. People who have been in car accidents cannot make a decision because there's no emotion. So you can't completely el eliminate emotions but you can embrace your emotions and not let them get the best of you and again for me it's like watching a movie and I got that straight from Douglas I try to it's your phraseology if that's a word and how you look at things you need to look at things like oh that's interesting and see it as happening and not happening to you and it's like Tyson said everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face and that's true but you have to find out ways to automatically execute your plan 
When I exit a stock on a stop, if I manually do it, and the stop isn't already in place, which we could have a different conversation about that. My stop sometimes isn't in place because I'm applying discretion. But when I manually exit a stop, it's almost like, and I'm going to go a little weird on you here, but it's almost like an out-of-body experience. It's like I feel like I don't have, it, how do I explain this? It's like my hand automatically goes to the mouse and clicks sell, all shares, yes, bam. Okay? And it's like that happens before I can think about it too much. Because I know if I start thinking those bad emotions are going to creep into my decision-making process. I know I've got to get out of that position. And you know what? If a stock is not performing, I'm happy to exit it. And you have to reach a point where you're happy to exit bad performance stocks. I got one less problem without you, okay? Like, uh, what's her name, Andrea, we talked about this morning? Is her name Grande? Grande? Grand? Whatever her name is. Andrea Grand? Ariada Grand? I don't know. She's in my column this morning, okay? Um, but I got one less problem without you. And, and, and you'd be surprised. That negative stop blinking red, blink, blink, blink all day in your portfolio, that aggravates you. That's going to wear you down. I'd rather see stocks blink green to make me feel a little better. So just be antiseptic about them and realize that your job is to get rid of the losers and keep the winners. Uh, if you were, I'm not a huge football fan. I watch the Saints and that's about it. But we're just getting out of preseason and, and it's like they had to cut a bunch of guys. Well, they, they, what did they do? Did they, did they cut the guy? Did they cut Drew Brees, the star quarterback, Super Bowl quarterback, still kicking butt? No, but they cut some lesser guys who weren't performing. Okay, they had to because you got to get down to a certain number. But you don't keep a guy thinking that maybe someday he'll start performing, within reason, obviously. I mean, if they show promise, then you keep them. Um. Again, play games, like look at things like, oh, that's interesting, and I know it's kind of hard, but um, after a while you, you kind of get used to doing these things and it becomes a little bit easier. Um, what would Ron Papillo do? Ron Papillo invented the Showtime Rotisserie 2000, and his claim to fame, or at least in one of his advertorials, he would say, set it, and then the audience would say, and forget it, okay? And he'd cook your little rotisserie chicken on your Showtime 2000 Rotisserie Grill. Uh, learn to call versus collect. We're not stock collectors. I collect stock certificates and I put them on my wall, okay, and I collect a lot of other things. I've been collecting stuff all my life, and it's probably good I'm married because, uh, you know, I got, a, I got a buddy of mine. He's from Mississippi, and he'll come over, and he'll be in my garage, and he'll be like, I was watching an episode of Hoarders, and in that episode, you know, just to harass me. So it's probably good that I'm married. But I do collect things. I like collecting things. Um, but you're not a collector. You're a caller. Your job is to call, to call out the bad stocks and keep the winners, okay? And then, you know, you got to hate stocks. I wrote a column a few weeks back. It's like, I hate stocks. It's like I used to love stocks. I used to want to buy as many as I could. I guess I was more of a collector back then. But now I hate them. It's like if you're in my portfolio, you better start doing something. You better go up and then not hit that. If you hit the stop, you're out. And then I don't know how I, how many times I could say it or how many different ways I could say it. But you got to realize there's going to be more. There's, there's, gonna, there's always going to be another one. Okay. And so you don't have to. Now be skeptical in your portfolio, but be an, be an optimist in life. Nobody wants to be around or, uh, somebody who sits around all day and reviews book reviews, some malignant person like that. Nobody wants to hang out with that person, okay? You want to be a pessimist when it comes to your portfolio, though. You want to make sure if you need to get out, you get out. You do what you have to do, okay, when you have to do it. Um, getting back to the market, take things one day at a time. Oh, a couple questions coming in. Rule number two, if you hit initial profit target up to half of you need to go. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true, that's true too. Okay, now that's a, that's a, Denise Shull. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, yeah, I want to give Denise credit for 
uh, talking about psychology, and that's that was my takeaway from her lecture. Um, and, and that's the beauty of the educational side of this business. You just need one takeaway from a lecture or from a book or from any or, or webinar or anything. If you can get one takeaway that strikes a chord with you and makes some sense, then then that's that's wonderful. And usually, if you can get one, you'll get a few more. But uh, Denise Show was talking about the emotions and how you cannot make a decision without emotions. So her point is that you can't eliminate emotions in trading, but you can certainly embrace them. Um, Market Mind Games, A Radical Psychology of Investing, Trading, and Risk, written by Denise Scholl. Okay. Uh, that's who said the process, thought of context, and emotion. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. And thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I hate. I really hate to, to not give credit what credit is due when I, when I mention someone. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Enron. <laughs> what does that mean? Is that out of the context? Okay. Um, now, when you're looking at a market, keep in mind that each day brings a new clue, and this was from last week. If you have more negative and positive events, it's possible cause for concern, and that's what we're going to get to in a few minutes here. If you have more positive than negative events, then it's possible that it's cause to celebrate or you're in an uptrend. Uh, the bad day, good day, you have a good day, bad day, good day, bad day. Uh, maybe this market is just choppy. Oh, you know, I don't have Enron. I wonder, I bet that's a collector's item. I bet that'd be hard to get. It's kind of like um, I have a currency collection on my other wall, and it's like the um, I've got um, some $100 trillion notes. I bought like a dozen of them or whatever a few years back on eBay, and I was giving them away to people. Um, they're fun when you're at lunch with a bunch of people or dinner or whatever, and you say, oh, I got this, and you throw $100 trillion on the table. <laughs> But those things have gone up about 500%. I wish I'd have bought a couple thousand of them, so that would have been a really good investment. But I ma imagine Enron stock certificates, I bet they're not cheap. In fact, I'm going to try to buy me one today. That's a, that's a great idea. An Enron. Yeah, you know what, what? What great symbolism is that? To have that on your wall as a constant reminder that stocks are just trading vehicles. Uh, I bought Enron on the way up, but I'm sure I got stopped out at some point. And I think I made money on it, uh, but I certainly did write it all the way down. I don't know if I shorted it or not. seems like I'd remember if, I, if I'd have shorted it. But, yeah, it was probably a good short, too, at some point. But, yeah, what a wonderful reminder. Okay. Um, and last week when things were, were kind of iffy but looking a little bit better, I said sometimes one bad day is just one bad day. Okay. And sometimes the top is more of a process than an event. And the good news is, uh, most of the time, you don't, you don't just have this one day and the market has completely topped. Usually it starts doing like it's doing now. It's kind of the kind of becomes a little frayed around the edges for a little while and some things start to unfold. And we'll look at some of those in a minute. Now, when you have an emerging trend pattern like a bow tie, reversal gap strategy, or something like that, and it's coming off a major, major high, or all-time high, ideally, you're going to have the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market. So if the market is headed higher and higher and higher, everyone who has ever bought that market is out of profit. However, when that market begins to roll over a little bit, everybody from this point higher is losing money, and... Every party, everybody from this point higher, right, is losing open profits. So these people, these Johnny Come Latelys, those who bought right towards the end of the trend, and those people, by the way, are the fast money, and that's what helps to get the ball rolling with these pioneer patterns. And we'll talk about that in one second. But these people who bought way back here are losing open profits, and then anybody in between is at the risk of having their their investment, and I'm making little air quotes, is at the risk of having their investment go from a winning investment to a losing 
investment. Okay. So everything I do from a technical analysis standpoint has some sort of psychological bias behind it. Okay. In this particular case, we're talking about people who were previously long and they are now under pressure to sell their stock should you get a first thrust, a bow tie, or whatever. And the more it drops, the more people over here are going to become unhappy. Now, keep in mind that you are still a pioneer. I get asked all the time. Hey, Dave, why not wait for a weekly signal? Well, the problem with a weekly signal is, let's say this is a weekly chart, okay? By the time you get a weekly signal, you might be all the way down here. Now, we've had some pretty good weekly signals on the S&P 500. We're getting ready to get a weekly signal on the Russell 2000. We'll look at that when we get to the charts. So, yes, there is... Some merit to weekly signals, but the problem with a weekly signal is by the time you get a setup, it might be too late, okay? And on a weekly chart, if you might have a rollover like this where it looks like the market's coming unglued, on a weekly chart, it might, looks like, might look like this. It might look, like, look just like a pullback. So especially on the short side where they slide much faster than they glide, although you can't have markets like 2009 where – the bottom was a little bit more than an of an event than a process, okay? So keep that in mind. But especially the short side, you almost have to take this transitional pattern because if you wait for that weekly chart to trigger, your daily chart is going to end up looking like this, okay? So, but this kind of brings us back, it's back to the pioneer thing. Keep in mind that this transitional pattern could just be a correction, on a bigger picture time frame, okay? Now, remember, not every pattern will turn into the mother of all winners, okay? But every top, okay, or bottom, but every top will have some sort of emerging trend or a transitional pattern, and I use those two words interchangeably. I'm thinking about changing the word transitional to emerging, Trends. Now let's look at uh, Skechers, and this was a bit of a pioneer signal here. You got a little bit of a first thrust kind of action. Notice that it's in a long, 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 longer term uptrend, okay? And then it begins to break down a little bit. Well, you've got a gap down, reversal gap strategy is a gap within 10 bars of a new high, a gap down, okay? So what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Perfect. Okay. Um, ideally, you want to see a market make a new high and the next day make a gap down. Okay. That is an early signal of a possible pattern. I guess, you know, I'm always saying don't get caught up in one bar patterns when it comes to something like candles and all. But I guess that would be a one bar pattern that is a little bit concerning and that you might want to pay attention to. New high and a gap down the day after. It's probably called a a baby out in the middle of the woods or something like that. A baby just thrown out the window. Don't they call a gap a window? A baby thrown out the window. I don't know. Whatever. Um, and you can see that the bow ties caught up pretty quickly here. It's more of a first thrust at a bow tie, but I didn't want to put the bow ties in. And it triggered a couple days ago. I actually triggered yesterday, but aggressive entry would have been in a little bit earlier on that one. Okay. So we'll see what happens. It'll be fun to watch this one unfold. I like to show them to you as early as possible as opposed to waiting for them to, um, to do something and then show you in hindsight. Let's talk a little bit about the second mouse. Um, let me check my audio. Still working? Yeah, still working. Um, years ago, I was talking with Cameron Haggerty. And he was telling me that the new guys, when he gets a new guy in, he doesn't allow them to take um, first signals. Okay? He has them take second signals only. And there's an old Wall Street adage at first, the early bird gets the worm, the second mouse gets the cheese. 
Well, what's kind of interesting is that we did have a bow tie off of all-time highs in the piece over the summer. But if you look, your setup was right here, and it kind of barely went below that setup. So that's one thing that I preach is that you do want to use somewhat of liberal entry. So this bow tie obviously didn't work, but sometimes when you get that second bow tie, especially when it goes up to make a marginal new high. Now, let me just show you something real quick. I preach this almost every week, but let's do it again. Double tops rarely unfold in a perfect textbook manner, meaning that you get a top and then you get another top. Okay. Do read Schaubacher. Do read Edwards and McGee. Do read uh, anything that Murphy's written. Do read anything that Pring has written when it comes to these primers and technical analysis books. Um, Read the basics from Gann. Don't 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 get caught up caught up in some of that um, archaic weird stuff that he does. But read the basics of Gann too. And but here's the thing: a double top. What happens is the market rallies up and stalls short of that double top, fakes everybody out. Okay. So right around here, everybody thinks, well, it's at least going to go to so highs that they dope it fakes everybody out. Or what happens? It overshoots that top. <laughs> It makes everybody think that it's going to keep on going and it's broken out. And then what happens? It comes back in. So if this is A, B, C, we got a C pattern now in the P's because we went up and we made these marginal new highs. Also on a micro level, you kind of made a minor double top in here too. Now the reason I'm showing you this is you got back-to-back -back bow ties. And when you have that second bow tie off of a double top, sometimes it could be very powerful. Okay. I hope it doesn't work. Uh, this market, by the way, if all you had, and this is why you need to go back and study 20 years of the market or 30 or 40 or more, if all you had to go off of was from 2009 till today, roughly five years, let's say, you would look at a market and say, well, it looks like it just goes up most of the time. And every now and then it looks like it's going to roll over. Okay, since 2009, it looks like this. Every now and then, it looks like it's going to roll over, but nope, it goes right back up. So I'm not going to get caught up in one of these rollovers. Well, it's never different this time. Trust me, okay? More fortunes have been lost by saying it's different this time than any other phrase, with that phrase, okay? So when you do see that bow tie, especially coming off of all-time highs, please, please pay attention. And if you have time, go in and study some of the all-time highs and lows of the market. It doesn't just have to be stocks. It could be in something inefficient like Forex. And I think it was 2008. We had the major top of the euro, whenever it was, five or six years ago. Euro was with Buck Narnie. Where's it now? Buck twenty four, and that was off of major top. All right. Any questions while we're um, before we hop into the overall market? Okay. Um, I don't think I have much for announcements. Store is open. Um, feel free to visit. <laughs> and the reason I opened the store was that. Um, I had somebody was looking at my website and they said, Dave, why do you, you have really good stuff. Why do you hide it? And I'm like, well, you're right. So it's all that from the store. Um, flash drives, I got plenty in stock. Usually I can't keep them in stock. And uh, lately I've got plenty in stock. Um, so check those out. If you like these shows, you'll love the flash drives. A lot of good information, if I say so myself. Um, I think that's good for now. We'll um, hop into the rest. Any ways to leverage at home? ProShare seems to be the only choice to retail traders. Um, well, Andre, leverage, is, leverage cuts both ways. Uh, very dangerous thing to, to, to get leveraged up. Um, and then if you're trading properly, let me just show you something here real quick then leverage becomes a wash, okay? Now, if you're taking a, um, I just, I spent an hour telling you don't 
trade options. But if you're taking, if you are making a gamma play in options, and if you don't know what that is, then then you shouldn't be doing it. But if you are making a short-term gamma play in options, then you could be leveraged. But that's that's a lottery ticket type of trade. That's almost that's on the cusp of gambling. Okay. Um, but let's get back to like pro shares or something. If you're trading properly and position trading, then let's say you've got a market that's here, and this is 1x, meaning um, no leverage, okay? So let's say your stop is, let's just call it, um, oh, I don't know. Let's just say 1 to make it easy. Your stop's going to be 1 point away from the market. Now, let's say you have a two times leverage market, okay? Well, that volatility of that market, like if it's a pro shares or whatever, is going to be twice as much. So the underlying chart's going to move around twice as much, okay? So the stop is going to be two times away from where the price is. So you would buy half as much as this, okay? If it's three times leverage, then you would buy one-third as much as this. Following my methodology, which is position trading, swing to intermediate term. So if it's three times leverage, the underlying security is going to move around three times as much. So you buy one-third as much. What's, one, what's three divided by? You divide it all out, and you end up with the same amount. You see it up with... A same amount of position risk wise but you end up with a third of the amount of shares so the only way to ever use leverage would be if you're playing like a gamma play in options on something that's very short dated there's no need for me to explain that because if you don't know what it is you shouldn't do it but if you know what it is you have obviously studied options for long long time tread lightly okay Phil says on leverage it's actually worse unless you're trading short term you have erosion in the tracking vehicles as well in most cases yeah absolutely and Phil I, I, I spent a lot of time Phil Phil's one of my favorite clients um, because he gets it and that's what I want I want educated clients that get it I don't want to spend my day going Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't honor your stop, you poor thing. Oh, it'll be okay. Let me give you a little hug. No, get out. Your stop gets hit, get out. Okay? But Phil gets it. And I, I mean, that's what I want, educated clients. I've, I've got people telling me that I'm dreaming. That'll never happen. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this until I get a bunch of educated people. And then we're all going to relax and trade the markets. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. Okay? I'm trying to learn how to be a dumb trend following moron. Well, that's Phil. Yeah, you know, I got to tell you, man, that was an epiphany in my life. And that was, that was a, <laughs> a wonderful thing when somebody called me a trend following moron. I'm like, you know what? Jeez, I, I'm not trying to outsmart these markets, you know, and I'm pretty sure I know who it is. And they had on, they had on a huge leverage position that was just the opposite of what I was saying because I was following the big arrows of the market and I was doing what I was supposed to do. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at the overall market real quick and then um, what I want to do is uh, then we'll jump into the sectors and then we'll jump into the individual issues. But if you want to start asking about stocks, feel free to start doing that now. Do me a favor, ask about one stock at a time on each line. If you ask about two or three what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick one of those, and then um, I might not remember to get back to the other one. But it makes it easier for me to pick a stock or to see what you're looking at, and then um, and then do the other one. I'm going to go to a black. I like a black background better, if you guys don't mind. Uh, let's go black. I like white in the slides so I can draw on it. All right, let's take a look at the piece. P that's 500. Okay, uh, we're just looking at the S&P, and you can see. Look, it's beginning to uh, implode, as uh, Phil or somebody pointed out here just a second ago. And yeah, you're right. So, uh, pretty oversold, pretty fast. 
Not that you want to trade overbought, oversold, because overbought, oversold could always become more of a bought or more oversold. But this market is pretty oversold, so it's probably due to bounce at some point. But that doesn't mean you want to rush out and trade it. But it looks like, it now looks like the damage may be done. Um, 1,900 round numbers. Looks like we should get a little support there, which will be right on top of this prior base. Um, resistance once supported, once I'm sorry, once broken becomes support. Support once broken becomes resistance. So if the market does get below this level here, it might have a hard time getting back through it. Just like it's broken down below this little short-term base in here, when it gets back to that base, people who bought around that level will be inclined to get out of break even. Again, there's nothing magical about what I do. I probably spend too much time telling you how easy it is. Um, it's not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most people make it. Okay, Robert says 200-day moving average is 1901. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Robert. Um, I used to joke with another trader. There's an old Cajun joke about the fact that the thermos keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. And Boudreaux says, how do it know? Okay. <laughs> and that the how do it know thing is really cool with technical analysis. Okay. It's like a lot of technicals come together at the same point. Notice that this little support here is right around the top of this range. Notice that the 200-day moving average is right around 1900, which is right around the top of this prior prior, prior range. So I kind of preach don't use a whole lot of indicators, but even if you did use various indicators, a lot of times it's kind of like an all roads leads, leads to Rome kind of thing. A lot of times you will find that they're, they're or in agreement. You'll have a confluence when it comes to these, okay? So that's the P's. Uh, back to chart way out. We had a pretty good run daylight-wise above that 200-day moving average. It, by the way, if all you did was trade daylight and trending markets, you would be pretty good. I was talking with someone yesterday, or day before, thing, day before, and they were giving me their moving average system, and I thought it was very plausible. And they were pretty amazed at how great it worked. And I said, okay, that's great. It's a little simple system. I said, unfortunately, it's not going to work so great when the market hits a choppy period. Well, then the next thing you'd think, at least is what I thought 20-something years ago, well, let's, let's come up with a filter for choppy markets. Well, by the time you do that, it'll start getting more and more complicated, and then you no longer have a simple trend-following system. A simple trend-following system. Something such as drawing arrows, okay, hello, will work great in a trending market. When the market isn't trending, not so much. Now, a simple concept like daylight, you got a moving average. Daylight meaning the hot, the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? Lows are greater than the moving average. And on the downside, the highs are less than the moving average. So the simple concept of daylight will help to keep you on the right side of the market. So this is a simple, 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 uh, the mother of all simple trend-following systems, right, is just use daylight to keep you on the right side of the market, okay? So let's go, let's see, the um, this new program is not working like I wanted to. There we go. Um, so just by following daylight... Now, I'm showing you, this is a, um, what do you call it, a well-chosen example? But it's a current example, and I think it's relative. Notice that the lows have stayed above that moving average for a long, 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 long time. So if all you did was say, I want to be mostly long when the lows are greater than the moving average, and you could pick whatever moving average you want. I know Phil likes the 50-day moving average. Um, I like my bow tie moving averages. I've got some, um, I know some people who like like a 7 and 11 day moving average and things like that. Whatever you like, whatever you use the most. It's not my way or highway. 
But you can see we've had daylight for a long, long time. Looks like we're getting ready to go kiss that moving average. Okay. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. All right, there's your quack. Um, where's the 50-day moving average? I'm sorry, 200-day moving average? 4,300. Where is the recent support? About 4,300. Okay, again, how do it know? Uh, let's take a look at the bow ties there. And as you can see, we are now bow tied down on the NASDAQ. So on a bounce, you would have a shorting signal on the NASDAQ itself. Okay? Now, it's not the end of the world. I'm not calling the mother of all tops. I hope the market turns around and goes right back up. Over the last several years, every time the market has tried to roll over, what's happened? Well, the Fed's come throwing some gas on the, on the, on the fire, and the market is going back up. Hopefully, the Fed's got some gasoline left. I don't care as long as it goes up. I'm not going to sit around and, and complain about the Fed all day. I've got other things to do. All right, let's take a look at the Rusty. Now, the Rusty is just abysmal. Okay, um, it's been going sideways for about a year, and now we're taking out the bottom of its range. Okay, let's put that 200 in here, and you can see that it's long since left its 200-day moving average, and we've got a lot of daylight below that moving average. Let's clean this chart up and put the moving average back in. Okay, um, I. I'm not a huge fan of the 200 and the 50-day moving average, but what you're going to find is if you if you follow me long enough, whenever the market gets a little iffy, I start plotting my 50-day moving average and plotting the 200-day moving average. Uh, it, whoever said plot the 200, thanks for the reminder. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Uh, I may have forgotten to do that. But notice that we had quite a bit of daylight so far underneath the Rusty. Okay. And just for S and G's, notice that we did have, did have a pretty good run above that moving average, lows greater than the moving average for quite a while. Okay, and now it looks like uh, looks like we're headed a little lower here. So we have taken out the lows, and we are at now. If we close down here, we'll be at the lowest level since when? Lowest level, I don't know if you can see that you can't see this on your screen. Lowest level since October 10th, 2013. Okay. Or thereabouts. Maybe the 11th. Let's just say the 11th. Okay. So, for all intents and purposes, we're at one year lows in the Rusty. And that's not a good thing. And by the way, I said this last week or week before, if you're trading momentum like we are, which is, means that we're trading smaller, inefficient stocks, and you look at the Rusty, and what, what do you see when you look at the Rusty? If you've been following these columns or following my webinars, you're going to see this. It comes up. Oh, is it coming up? There it is. Um, an electrocardiogram, okay? That's what an electrocardiogram looks like. It's not a market you want to be trading. And that's what the Rusty looks like, at least over the last about a year, you know? If you can look at a market and see it go beep, beep, or here, I'm sure, if you, it, if you look at a market in the back of your head, you hear it go beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and now, deed. <laughs> It's probably a market you don't want to be trading, and this sort of exemplifies why it's been hard to catch a trend, in, a catch a longer term trend in some of these momentum issues. There's been some good trades, but not a whole lot of um, longer term trends. I know trades, just that, not uh, trades that turn into longer term um, investments, so to speak. IWM's looks like it triggered a head and shoulder with a target around 96. Well, I'm not a big fan of of targets off a of head and shoulders, but it's a, if anything, I would say it's a complex head and shoulders, okay? Uh, we could probably reduce it down to two or three bars, and I would, if I had to call a head and shoulders, I would say it's a complex, meaning multiple heads, multiple shoulders, okay? Or two-headed head and shoulders, okay? 
Uh, let's let's take a look at let's reduce the chart down to see if we can get those peaks coming together. Four, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Now, what would Robert? I think it's Robert, or whoever said whoever pointed out the head and shoulders. Oh, Phil. Okay, Phil pointed out the um, head and shoulders. Um, so your measurement off of that would be something like this. And if you took that measurement, if I can grab it, if it'll let me grab it. There we go. It would be down like that. That would be a measurement off of classical technical analysis. And Phil saying 96. Yeah, okay. Yeah, close enough for government work. At least I think my chart drawing is that. So that's his point. Could go to 96. Um, certainly plausible. Okay, I can't argue with that. Um, you know, once a market starts trending, it could go anywhere. I mean, you, 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 it's hard to put an exact target on that. Okay. Uh, let me just bang out a few sectors real quick. It's like each week I think I'm going to spend a lot of time on the sectors, and the reality is we really don't have to. Um, you got some areas like the chem I'm just going to show you a representative sample. Some areas like the chemicals banged out all-time highs, and now they're beginning to implode, so that's a little bit concerning. Energy is just flat out continue to implode. Uh, there's your triple top. I get asked about classical technical analysis a lot. Classical technical analysis is a wonderful thing. Please read all those aforementioned books. Read them backwards and forwards and upside down and, and sideways and however you want to do it. But realize that technical analysis kind of paints the broad stroke, the big picture, and your setup is your actual trigger within that. Okay, So you see a triple top in energies. It doesn't mean you rush out and short the energies, but... If you see a first thrust in the energies, that might be your trigger or your clue that that triple top is beginning to work. Or throw in a bow tie, okay, and you see a double bow tie like this. See it bow tied, but by the time it's set up, it had already turned around and gone right back up, so there was no signal to take there. But now it's a little bit different story. you got a bow tie down off of multi-year highs, so that's a market that could be in trouble. Metals and mining have been doing what? Imploding. Gold has been doing what? Imploding. Okay. And you're thinking, okay, well, let's bottom fish in gold. It's down towards these multi-year lows. And every time else it's gotten down there, it's kind of bounced off of them. Well, I got two words for you. Silver. <laughs> Look what it did when it approached those lows. It went through them like butter. Let's look at the underlying commodity for gold. And you can see we are trying to scrape along the bottom here. Um, I was somewhere. What's his name? Oh, God, what's his name? It escapes me. Uh, Bernstein. Bernstead? Bern? No. Oh, God. He's been around forever. Jake? Bernstein? Bernstead? Bernstein? Jake Bernstein? Anyway, he was at a... Um, he was somewhere trading someone. Um, he was down in Australia speaking. Um, interesting character. Anyway, he said that he was looking with. He was teaching somebody how to read charts, and um, and they said the market was up here, and they said, well, it can't go any further because it's right up here. And then, of course, he did. He then did this, gave it a little bit of room. So <laughs> ever since. He said that. I, I just think it's kind of funny. So because it, it, there's there's a lesson to be learned here. Take a look at gold. Let's just zoom in on this a little bit. You look at gold, and heck, it looks like this 14 is going to support it, right? It's, that's as far as it can go. And it doesn't look that bad. It looks like the mother of all bottoms. But what happens when you start to back the chart out and the scaling begins to change? Okay, let's back it. Let's go to like a weekly chart, okay? Now you got a much bigger, different picture, okay, than just looking at Jake. Yeah, Jake Bernstein. Jake Bernstein. Um, anyway, you got a much different picture now in gold than you did before. Yeah, I'm still looking for a bottom here, but I'm not calling a bottom here. Now, if we get a bow tie off of multi-year lows, I think I'll go for it, okay? But I'm not going to buy it just because it looks low. Because bigger picture-wise, where could gold go, okay? Gold could go to $500 an ounce. No way, Dave, that'll never happen. Well, 
Just look at the chart. It was at five dollars an ounce, two thousand and six. Who says we can't go back there? We got we got wars. We got plagues. <laughs> we got Nick and Mariah getting a divorce. I mean, all of these things. And gold is eh, what be worry. It's mostly gone down. Somebody pointed out silver, and silver is a great example of what could happen if you get a little too caught up in the fact that just because something is hitting new lows doesn't mean it's going to stop hitting new lows, okay? And that's why I ripped this person a new one who's going to buy options on a gold stock that's obviously going down, okay? Uh, without going into too many more of these areas, just know that a lot of areas recently hit brand new highs like the banks and have since rolled over and have since bow tied down. Uh, just a few weeks ago, even I felt a lot better about the market than I do now. So a lot of people are on the wrong side of the market based on that. A couple of areas like drugs hanging in there, but they are beginning to lose some momentum. And never forget to draw your line or measure at least backwards, okay, and see where market is today. And where was it a couple of months ago or a month ago? And see if it's lost some momentum by obviously trading sideways. So important thing to do. Uh, health services was at brand new highs a couple of weeks ago. Now it has bow tied down. Okay. Uh, retail hasn't come unglued just yet, but it was recently at brand new highs, and now it's kind of coming back down. And finally, let me just show you the civvies. This is one area where I think it's worth watching because you've got that double bow tie pattern that's working. Okay. Kind of bow tied here. Nothing really happened, and now you kind of get the second mouse type of signal here off a double top type of situation. So it looks like the 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 top is done. Okay. Not Stan Weinstein, How to Make Money in Bull and Bear Markets. Yeah, it's a good book. I have it here. Um, it's definitely worth reading. Okay. I mean, I'm glad I read. I'm glad I read that book after I wrote mine because I probably would have borrowed from him. Um, it's that good. <laughs> Jake, Jake's my boy. <laughs> you know Jake? Jake's my boy. All right. Um, let's let's look at some stocks. Oh, before we do that, okay. Uh, what moving average is best for daylight? I like, I like exponential moving averages when it comes to daylight. Okay. I like bow ties for bow tie's sake. Um, for the for the crossing over pattern. And I like exponential moving averages when it comes to daylight because you know you get a case like uh, if, if you use like a 200 simple that's gonna really take a long time to catch up to the market um, and a lot of you can have a lot of damage happen until that does okay so um, from 2000 round numbers to 19 now keep in mind it's an overall market what's that a thousand points a thousand Divided by 2,000 is what is that? That's a uh, 5%. Well, that's not a huge drop. It's a substantial amount for a market, but it's not that far, a 5% drop. So, But in general, um, a market could, could really get away from that exponential, I'm sorry, from that simple moving average, whereas an exponential moving average is going to catch up. Just for snits and giggles, let's put in a... Um, Let's put in a 200 exponential. Nope, an exponential is really not catching up that much. I thought it would be much higher. In fact, this is kind of bizarre. The simple is actually above the exponential. That's interesting. Um, I don't know why. There's going to be a drop-off effect here, too. Um, that's going to make that... Maybe when the drop-off effect kicks in, the exponential will catch up. But that's kind of interesting. I've never – that's an anomaly. Has anybody experienced that before? The, a, a longer – maybe it's because it's longer term. It's turning faster. Okay. Um, well, it's not turning faster yet. But, um, yeah, let me know if you've experienced that. There's a couple of uh, interesting things. Uh, Greg Morris taught me this little tidbit. When a market closes below – an exponential moving average, at least a, a shorter term exponential moving average. Notice that the moving average will immediately turn down. Okay, that's how fast it will catch up. 
to the market and begin to have a negative slope. As soon as a market closes below an exponential moving average, that's good information to know. So you can always, you can, I, I hate to call him an old timer, but you can always pick up something from these old timers. Okay, linear market, turning faster, okay. Stop, DE, not a good entry now, but why was it a good short previously, all right? Well, DE is going to be a big, thick stock. That's uh, my big green tractor, right? Um, and the reason it wasn't a good short previously is because the stock's a bit of an electrocardiogram. Notice that it kind of trades all over the place, okay? So that's why it wasn't really a good short because it trades all over the place. Doesn't mean that you can't short uh, efficient stock. If you read the Go Go Nomo on my website, occasionally an efficient stock will show up as a setup. But take a look at the HV, the historical volatility on John Deere. It's 11. And what is it in the spiders? It's 9. Okay, so you're right about the same HV as the overall market. Um, I prefer to trade more inefficient stocks, okay? All right. James wants to know about PTCT, another one of my favorite clients, Mr. James. Um, it needs a little bit more pullback, but it certainly looks good. I think it's one of the few stocks that are left in my momentum list at this juncture. Maybe a little bit more pullback. Frame it within... The overall market, framing within the fact that the IBB has lost some steam, okay? Uh, let's take a look at biotech as a sector. Framing within the fact that biotech, you know, what did, what did I just say? When it closes below the moving average, the moving average will automatically begin to turn down, at least with an exponential moving average and a very short-term moving average, okay? You should have shorted F for Don. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, did, now, look, my chart's all marked up here. Did I say it was a short back here? I sure hope I did. Um, I don't know if Don's here or not, but Don, if you're here, just in case he's in the other room, Don, Don, looks like Ford's going down. I just drew an arrow for you. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. I, I enjoyed that. To those of you who don't know, Don shows up every week and asks about Ford. And we harass him, thinking that someday he'll leave. But he shows up every other week and asks about four. Uh, Novotel. Sounds like the Notel Hotel. Um, one thing I think I liked about this one last week is the fact that it is accelerating in its momentum. Uh, maybe on a pullback, maybe a tiny bit more pullback. It's like you hate to see it pull back too much into this. Um, and I'm, I hate to say this on every position, but frame it within the overall market. Also, longer term, a little wide and loose. I probably personally wouldn't take this because I don't like the wide and loose longer term action. However, over the shorter term to intermediate term, I certainly see what you're looking at. I can't argue with that. All right, James wants to know about GPRE as a short. Yeah, that one triggered. That was in the Landry list like um, two days ago. Uh, my only problem... With shorting something like this, it's just a dangerous stock to short because it's a um, it's some sort of um, green energy or something where it could it could certainly um, do some things. But that's definitely a go go. That's definitely a go go nomo. Uh, but you can see you got a nice first thrust, broke down on the first thrust. So yeah, on subsequent pullbacks, it might be worthwhile. But that's a good look. That's a good looking setup. Uh, I bet you a hundred bucks. It's also a bow tie. And then, bam, yeah, also a bow tie down. Uh, this is what I call a little bit more of a forced bow tie. Bow ties were designed to catch more gradual rollovers, okay, although they do quickly catch up. But when you have a first, look for a first thrust first, as I often preach, and then wait for that bow tie to show up. Okay. TTPH. Okay. Um, well, it's definitely trending, and it's still in my momentum list, okay? Um, wait for a pullback, and then let's talk again. Uh, it did gap higher. It did have a nice persistent move higher. So far, so good. Maybe on a pullback. 
James wants to know about camera on a stick. Uh, maybe on a pullback, okay? Uh, well, it is pulling back. Yeah, I mean, be careful. Uh, kind of a trend knockout. Uh, just be careful. Be really careful. Make sure you wait for an entry. Uh, this one may be done. Um, we initially had this one as a buy at 46 after the IPO webinar. And uh, it didn't trigger, and I actually took it off the radar. But based on that, shoulda, coulda, woulda, sure looks like um, that would have been a good one to follow up on. But, yeah, TKO, not bad looking, accelerating. Um, you know, here's a case where it's this camera on a stick, stupid stock, stupid stock. But who cares? Um, and, and sometimes your stupid stocks are the best stocks. So if it does trigger up around, let's say, around 90 or so, I think a lot of people are going to have a hard time believing that camera on a stick is a viable company, and it'll it'll just defy gravity. But be careful. I mean, that's going to be a dangerous one, okay? Hello, Dave, short DV. Hello, Howard. DV. Let's see if we can get this over here. Do, 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 do. Talk amongst yourselves. DV. Uh, no. Well, first of all, um, you probably don't know this, but there's certain sectors I'm not big fans of. Airlines, for instance, it seems to as soon as they go up, no pun intended, they come right back down. <laughs> so my my joke there is wait till an airline goes up and then short it. Um, I'm not a big fan of shipping stocks. I find they tend to chop around a lot, and I'm not a big fan of educational stocks. They tend to chop around a lot too. And if you're looking at the Vry, when I first look at this stock, what am I seeing? Electrocardiogram. Okay, so. That's first and foremost. Um, I think there's just too much out there. When, when the overall market looks like this, when the overall market looks like this and you have a bow tie down, okay, then you want to avoid the stocks. You especially want to avoid the stocks that look like electrocardiograms, okay? Find a stock that looks at least as good as the overall market. Write that down. I think I just I think I just backed into something there by accident. Find a stock that looks at least as good as the overall market. Because the overall market is going to be more efficient and more choppy. So if it doesn't look as least as good as the overall market, then you want to pitch it. Okay. Bullish percentage, NYSE, BP, NYA, strong bear signals. BP, NYA, bullish percentage. Okay. Yeah, I can't, um, I can't plot that. Uh, what Andre is saying is the, bullish, the people that are, that, are, that are bullish percentage of NYSE is a strong bear signal. The problem with following something like that is how do you know what sort of it is? It's like... And that's subject to change at a moment's notice. I mean, I, I have an idea what I'm going to eat for lunch, but I can't tell you for sure. I might change my mind between now and then. So how are you going to poll a bunch of people and ask them, are they bullish or are they bearish? Are they, how do you know they're not going to change their mind? How do, you know, how do you know they told you the truth? Um, I don't know how to quantify that. I don't know how to use it. I think it's something that, as far as I'm concerned, I can't wrap my head around it. So I don't know how you could use it. And Here's the thing with that too. Let's say that let's say that your numbers are accurate, okay? And that this is how those people truly do feel and you got very good accurate numbers and tracking. Well, what did I just preach about bow ties? Bow ties coming off of all time highs. What did I just preach about that? Well, let me let me recant, okay? When a bow tie, oops, let's try that again. When a bow tie comes off of, or some other transitional pattern, comes off of all-time highs, the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but everybody I bought back here, is happy. Everybody bought back here is happy. Okay. Everybody bought here is happy. Okay. 
So the majority amount of people, when that market rolls over, are on the wrong side of the market. Well, guess what? Take a poll here. Well, 100% of these people are going to be bullish. The most amount of people are on the wrong side of the market. So your bullish sentiment is always going to be huge at the top of the market. But is it? Is it top here? 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 Is the top here? Yes. So based on bullish percentage, it called the top of the market. Okay. But you can see my point in following a sentiment type of indicator. Okay. It's like overbought, oversold. The market might be really overbought before it crashes. But it might stay overbought for a while. I mean, I've seen speakers, and it, it's amazing. You know, you've been around long enough, you just begin to see some amazing things. I've seen speakers show signals, market signals, like an oscillator. And here we have the oscillator to call the top of the market. Like, well, wait a minute. Your oscillator has been overbought for three years. Three years. Who could be off and wrong for three years? How do you hell you how do you hell you trade off of that? Okay? Three years. I, I don't get it. Okay. So I see sentiment, overbought analysis, things like that. I think it's I think it's fun to look at if you want. But I think it's hard to trade off of. Here's the other thing too, and and, and believe me, it's like uh, you know, true success is when you reach the beginning. It's like Bollinger had a quote in his forum that he got from. Um, oh, what was the? Uh, where did it come from? Some famous book or whatever. But he talks about true enlightenment begins when you get when you reach the beginning, and it's like you spend. You spend your first half of your career adding indicators on, and then, at least in my experience, I spent the second half of my career taking indicators off. So if you start adding in advanced decline, or bullish sentiment, and before you know it, you're going to end up with an analysis paralysis. It's just too much, okay? So you've got to be careful. Robert says, generally, why are longer term trends essential, not AKGs to swing trade short term if short term trend is persistent and accelerating and you're going to get a pullback? Okay, well, no problem, Robert. Um, you're, you're saying swing trade. Now, if you're being a swing trade purist, okay, what was that stock we looked at a couple stocks ago? Um, I don't know if we can go back. Can we go back that far? It was one of these. Oh, anyway, if you're a swing trade purist, then it's okay. Okay, let's say you have, let's say you have, let's say you got a stock with some overhead resistance. Let's say before that it was electric cardigan. It looked like that, okay? And then it goes down a little bit, bottoms out. And let's say you've got a pretty good looking pattern here. Uh, pretend that this in here. Pretend we're pretend it's just sideways in here. Okay. Well, you got this overhead resistance, and you know that if this stock triggers, it might run into rejection at that overhead resistance. Okay, human nature. Well, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with playing it for that move from there to there for a swing trade. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. I wouldn't personally take the trade is because because I I no longer play for just a swing trade. I play for a swing trade to hopefully an intermediate term move. I want to beat a stock three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. Okay. But I don't want to get into a stock unless I think it has both short term and longer term potential. I don't want to trade. Okay, I'm greedy. I want I want to capture the mother of all longer term moves. Okay. Andre wants to know about EIGI. Seems like I should say EIGIO, huh? EIGI. EIGI. Um, 
Yeah, it's another educational stock, okay? So you know how I feel about that. Uh, it's kind of electrocardiogram longer term. I hear you, though. Shorter term, it looks okay. It's another, it's kind of like forest for the trees. It looks okay back here, but it's pulled back below this peak. I would pass. So there's a lot of stocks that pulled back during the last few days. CTLT has bounced a bit quite back strongly. Yeah, they're still down day yesterday. Still a strong, so it's a good buy point. Well, we are we are along that one, CTLT, one of the few longs remaining. Um, what's a good buy point? You should you should buy all you can right now. Buy it all. Yeah, right now. Quick, run out, buy some. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, no, it looks good. It's defying gravity. Um, it's not set up again. I mean, it's kind of a double top knockout looking, uh, but it's not a perfect pattern. But, yeah, it's kind of double top knockout-ish here. If this move would be a little bit bigger down, and thank God it wasn't, uh, then I would say it's double top, top knockout-ish. Also, with IPOs, I have, a, um, without giving it away, but in the course we talk about selected uh, breakout patterns and what happens when an IPO begins to new, break, make new highs. As long as an IPO is making new highs, everybody's happy. It's a good thing. So it's right on the cusp of making brand new highs. Andre wants to know about Joe. That's going to be Java, I think. Something I enjoy a lot of. I love coffee. I really do. I love uh, cappuccinos in Italy. And I drink the espressos in the afternoons because if you order a cappuccino over there, they kind of look at you funny in the afternoons, even though I really want a cappuccino. Um, there's no structure to it. It's kind of all over the place. If you're going to trade a commodity... Let me tell you when to trade. Let me just give you a little hint here. Trade a commodity when it's down here and it makes a bow tie, okay? That's the best time to trade a commodity. A commodity is a more efficient market because you got a lot of players. you got big dudes like me drinking coffee and buying coffee, and then you got uh, roasters, producers, um, all kinds of people mixed in and people that um, – do whatever with coffee. It's just like a, a commodity or any commodity for that matter. You want to, your your best time to trade them is when they're making, when they're coming off of all-time lows and set up. Now it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. Howard says, teach you 107. That's going to be another one of those indicators that I ignore. T2107. have no idea what it is. Oh. Well, I'm okay with that. Percent of stocks above 20 moving average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with that kind of indicator. <laughs> I, I do that kind of analysis every now and then. That, now, that's okay. But don't factor it into your major work every day and make some kind of model based on that. How do I dig myself out of this without digging a hole? Well, it looks like it's time to wrap things up. <laughs> um, no, I do like just I do like to see what's going on internally, but I don't. I don't obsess over advanced decline lines and things like that, but I do like to look at things to see if they're deteriorating internally as opposed to like the S&P. Like a while back, I did a column, what's propping up the P's? Because you only had a few stocks, relatively speaking, in the S&P's that were going higher. So, yeah, I was going to poo-poo this indicator, but, yeah, it's, this is something to look at every now and then, percent of stocks above the 200-day moving average. Uh, in this morning's column, I wrote about the percent of stocks that were below the moving averages. So that's okay to do that. Just don't get too caught up in it. If you see a bow tie down and you also notice that, yeah, most of the stocks, you know, 60-something percent of all stocks are below the moving averages, then, then it's just kind of a confirmation. But don't get too caught up and don't end up with an analysis paralysis, okay? CNX, and a, yeah, CNX is going to be, is that a China one or I forget. This was on our buy list a while back. Uh, it's beginning to break down, though. It's done. Uh, stick a fork in it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy this stock. Um, it looks like it's on the cusp of rolling over. So yeah, on bounces, it might be worth a uh, while. Okay. Okay. Well, we're right at the hour and a half mark, which is usually right on the cusp of when these when these uh, recordings get to become a little bit unmanageable. So I'm going to go ahead and shut things down. Geez, uh, I appreciate all you guys attending, uh, taking time and your business schedules to be here. I'm flattered by your appearance. Uh, anything unanswered, you know the routine, DavidDaveLander.com. I, I enjoy these shows. I have a blast. I learn 
hopefully I'm, I'm, I know I learned from them. Hopefully you guys are learning too. But um, from a salvage standpoint, I do get a lot out of them, and I do really enjoy them. So everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, um, and I guess we'll um, we'll talk again next week. Thank you so much.